now. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to one more session of the Psy Cafe of the Hellenic Mediterranean University of the International Relations Office. Um, it's a great pleasure to have with us one of the most distinguished speakers that we have invited the last two years, uh, Professor Arben Merkozzi. Few words about the speaker. He is an ICREA research professor and a leader of the ICN2 nanobioelectronics and biosensors group. He obtained his PhD at the University of Tirana in ion selective electrodes. Since he since 1992, he has carried several uh, postdoctoral positions, uh, starting from the Polytechnic University of Budapest, University of Ioannina, Cal Calimera Arben, uh, Univers um, Università degli Studenti di Batova, Università Politecnica di Catalonia, Università Autonoma di Barcelona, and New Mexico State University. Uh, his research is focused on the integration of biological molecules and other species with uh, micro and nanostructures of interest in the design of novel biosensors. He's um, a, a, a point of reference regarding uh, these fields uh, in a worldwide uh, aspect. His work has received more than 26,000 citations and his age index is 85. He has a, he's a great teacher. He has supervised 35 PhD a thesis and uh, I admire also the effort that he's doing in order to bring science to his homeland, uh, Albania, with the establishing of the uh, nanotechnology center there. So Arben, it's a great honor for us, uh, for our university, your participation. I have to I have to I have to mention that whatever we are doing for our students, for our researcher, Arben always is very positive towards us. So thanks you again, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kostas, for the nice introduction. Uh, so, Kalimera, good morning, dear friends. It's really a pleasure for me to, to be with you uh, and uh, to meet uh, a lot of uh, Greek colleagues. Uh, as uh, Kostas mentioned, uh, I have been working in Ioannina, and uh, uh, for me, Greece, uh, Ioannina is a, a reference point in my career because uh, after I left my country, uh, I got a lot of uh, nice experience in Ioannina, in Greece. I should say it was one of the inflection points in my, my, my uh, scientific career because uh, uh, thanks to Professor Karayanis and um, other Greek uh, colleagues, professors in this uh, nice city, uh, uh, Ioannina, I, I, I learned a lot and really it was a, a fantastic period of uh, my, my life, uh, professional life and also uh, getting a lot of friends so uh, so anytime I can come in Greece or I meet with Greek colleagues it's really like I feel like home and it's really always a, a big pleasure. May I share the screen now just one second. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen in okay, full, thank you. full mode. Thank uh, you. What I am going to show you today is uh, uh, mostly what we are doing in Barcelona in relation to nanobiosensors for health related applications. We work also for other kinds of applications, also environmental monitoring, safety and security. But I'm going to focus more on some of the recent applications we have been working with uh, uh, for uh, uh, nanobiosensors. Uh, so I will just show you recent developments. I'm not going to show you uh, things that we have done in the past. Uh, uh, so uh, first of all, I'd like to, to show you what uh, uh, our center in general is, just to know, to have a little bit uh, feeling of uh, uh, Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. Uh, so, and after that, uh, I will give you some examples uh, uh, about uh, the point of care devices in health in general, uh, some optical sensors and electrochemical sensors we have been uh, developing and applying. So first about our center. So I work at Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. This is a joint research center. And this is why you see here different logos because uh, uh, these are our uh, patrons, so, so those who have funded this center. Uh, so and, uh, uh, we are part of uh, uh, like Barcelona Institute of Science and Technology, the CERCA, the network of research centers of Catalonia, and we have the support from 
uh, main government, Catholic regional government, and also Autonomous University of Barcelona. So uh, this is where we are. In fact, I am now uh, in this uh, uh, building. This is where I am, uh, Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. Uh, this is the yes, campus of, uh, of Bea Terra. Uh, so you see this mountain here. Behind this mountain is uh, Barcelona city. So we are like uh, 15 kilometers, uh, very well connected with Barcelona with uh, two line uh, train stations, line, uh, train, train lines, buses. So it's a beautiful area with a lot of uh, like a scientific park. Uh, in our campus, we have uh, uh, different research centers. We have also the synchrotron in addition to other uh, institutes and facilities with a cluster of around 750 scientists and technicians working in the area of nanomaterials uh, 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 for uh, different uh, applications. So uh, our center being the center of nanotechnology is working in different areas. So we work uh, in biosensors, bioelectronics for which I am responsible. Other colleagues of my institute are working in different areas uh, ranging from uh, nanostructures uh, studies, uh, understanding applications, uh, at nanoscale, nanoelectronics, uh, nanofabrication, magnetism, phononics, photonics, and more spintronics, uh, with a lot of work in the surface uh, uh, properties, characterization, and more. Uh, so uh, let me show now what uh, my group is doing. So the nanobioelectronics and biosensors group uh, uh, is focused in the study and understanding of uh, 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 properties of nanomaterials that uh, may be suspected with interest uh, in the field of nanobiosensors. So we have a lot of interest in basic research to understand the new phenomena, new properties of nanomaterials and trying to get these to transfer these properties uh, to uh, build the new uh, sensing by sensing uh, uh, mechanism and applications. Uh, we have been working a lot with the metallic nanoparticles uh, like gold nanoparticles, but also quantum dots, uh, in addition to uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, graphene, nanochannels, uh, uh, with interest uh, for, uh, to be applied in diagnostics, as I said, environmental monitoring, food quality, safety and security, and more. In addition, we have a lot of interest in technology transfer, and based on the technologies we have developed in our group, uh, we have already two spin-off company, paper drop uh, that is focused in the development of diagnostic devices based on paper like lateral flow and also graphenic lab uh, based on uh, patented technology. Uh, so graphene, exfoliated graphene stamped with uh, for different electronic applications, including biosensors. So you can see here just a summary of some recent developments that I'm going to show you. Uh, we have also a lot of interest in integration of the system. So building uh, whole integrated, uh, uh, complete integrated uh, uh, by sensing systems. Uh, so uh, in our group, uh, our research, as I said, is mostly focused in the understanding of new properties of uh, nanomaterials. We work a lot with graphene and 2D materials, as I said, nanoparticles, quantum dots. Uh, we have a lot of interest in paper-based sensors. So. Uh, lateral flow stays, uh, but also building hybrid electrochemical uh, uh, lateral flow stays with uh, optical redoubt, but also electrical uh, redoubt, uh, uh, and also uh, printing technologies, uh, inkjet printing, screen printing, uh, uh, also some collaboration with uh, field effect transistors. Uh, uh, and as I said, for us, it's very important also. Uh, to build fully integrated uh, point of care devices uh, connected also with smartphone, wearables, uh, uh, wearables uh, wireless readout using antennas and more. So uh, this is our team. So these are uh, the permanent people, but we have also some other uh, visiting uh, students. So I wish that uh, uh, colleagues from Greek also students uh, would be willing to come to work with us. Barcelona is a beautiful uh, city, Spain in general, is uh, as uh, beautiful as, as Greece, so you feel like home. Uh, so going now to, uh, in general, to the problems and needs that the health area has for point of care devices, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, very important to understand that uh, uh, this is uh, 
uh, a request, there is, there is a request for, for the development of point of care devices. And in fact, uh, uh, biosensors are a very good examples of uh, uh, point of care devices. And there is a need, a huge need, uh, even in the future. And here is just, uh, uh, are some data about only United States biosensor market. So you can see that uh, the need for different kind of biosensors uh, is uh, huge uh, uh, and probably in this uh, context, uh, electric, electrical, electrochemical biosensors uh, are one of the most uh, uh, requested because they are very easy. They are as simple as, for example, glucose biosensor that people suffering diabetes are using. And this is why this market, including now the wear, wearable uh, biosensors for glucose is uh, increasing a lot. So there is a, hu a huge market in this direction. Uh, for, but for these devices, so biosensors to be uh, useful, to be used as point of care, uh, they need to be reassured, uh, to fulfill the reassured criteria. It means that uh, they should have the possibility to, for the real-time connectivity, easy of specimen collection. So uh, it's important how you introduce the sample, either uh, uh, blood or saliva or other sample. These devices should be affordable. So uh, it is uh, related also to the cost. So if you have uh, uh, very expensive devices, very sophisticated techniques, it's very, very, very difficult to, to bring these to the end users. And of course, as this, uh, it, it should be affordable so people can, 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 can get this. Uh, uh, of course, these devices should be sensitive, specific, user-friendly also because they are sophisticated. Nobody is going to use rapid and robust sometimes equipment free, which is very, very, very important. Just think on the COVID-19 related diagnostics. So the devices we have been using and still are using are in fact very much requesting, fulfilling this requisite because otherwise you cannot, you cannot afford, for example, uh, diagnostics in situation like COVID uh, with uh, expensive devices. You need to have very cheap devices uh, that everyone can use and probably uh, several times during the period of pandemics. Uh, so we have a lot of interest in using substrates like uh, uh, paper. And uh, this is, for example, also the, the example of uh, lateral flow uh, used nowadays uh, as a rapid test for COVID. Uh, uh, because uh, paper is very, very interesting material. Uh, it is low cost, uh, abundant material, easy to manufacture, recyclable and sustainable, and also microfluidics uh, uh, you have uh, uh, due to the capillary forces uh, ensure a kind of zero energy device. So uh, this is really very, very interesting. And of course, uh, coupling these simple materials like paper or even plastics, as we are doing, for example, is very, very interesting because uh, we are trying to get to see the synergies between these materials and nanomaterials, uh, for example, plasmonic properties, electrocatalytic properties, or conductive inks, nano inks, for example, we are building uh, with interest, of course, uh, for different applications where we need also to work a lot with uh, receptors. We are working with DNA related receptors like aptamers, for example, or uh, other. Uh, synthetic uh, uh, receptors in addition to natural ones like uh, antibodies. So, and as far as for readers, uh, uh, we other use with uh, naked eye devices, like for example, in case of lateral flow for COVID, you, uh, you just see these uh, the, uh, the lines, uh, and these uh, red lines, in fact, are uh, uh, plasmonics uh, of gold nanoparticles. But if you want to have something more accurate and more quantitative, uh, we can use also a smartphone. We can also use some other devices that can ensure much more uh, facilities and much more measurements for different uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the, there are a lot of challenges in the PCIC field. Uh, we want sometimes to have these devices completely non-invasive, and this is very, very important. For example, uh, wearable devices are a very good candidate for this. Uh, sometimes we want to have a continuous monitoring, real-time biomonitoring, for example, in the case of uh, uh, some uh, glucose measurements in planted devices. So, there is a need to measure during the time or some other parameters with interest for different other uh, clinical scenarios. Uh, sometimes we need to generate data because depending on the application of biosensors, 
But one of the very, very important challenges is uh, to get the cheap, low cost devices that can be uh, disposable. So we call these cost efficient devices. This is very, very important. And of course, uh, an important issue is uh, how to correlate uh, the sensor data with uh, those that uh, the body body has in fact, because you can get uh, measurements uh, from a sample, but uh, it's very important that uh, a correlation exists between what you see in your sample and that the body uh, already has, uh, so as to understand the disease and get the decisions. So uh, this is why to address all these challenges are very, very important. As I mentioned also before, uh, the, the, the selection of nanomaterials you are using. So what kind of properties you are going to, to, to use, uh, the readout, very important, but also the substrates. Uh, uh, and based on all these, we have been working since many years, uh, uh, addressing different uh, interesting, important uh, applications, not only for uh, different diseases, where I've been working with Alzheimer disease, cancer, but also with some uh, uh, toxic and uh, related uh, applications, for example, the detect detection of bacteria, detection of pesticides uh, and uh, pollutants. Uh, uh, for example, here, there are just some uh, presentation of some of the applications we have been working with, uh, starting, for example, to uh, application of graphene. Uh, uh, this is uh, in connection to hydrophobine to, 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 to use graphene as a, a platform to immobilize different kinds of antibodies. Uh, we also integrated uh, gold nanoparticle based uh, detection system into PCR system. So uh, PCR is very, very important for uh, DNA detection and we introduced uh, in a PCR system gold nanoparticles and the magnetic beads uh, as a set also the connection of uh, the sensors with the smartphone. This is a simple example where a paper-based sensor is used uh, uh, for pollutants detection with the smartphone readout uh, or other uh, kind of applications. For example, in simple kits, uh, getting advantages of uh, uh, quenching of fluorescence, for example, to do some simple detections. Uh, and also, it is very nice to have this connection between the diagnostic and therapy. So uh, sometimes uh, for some applications and probably in the future, uh, we are going, going to have a very personalized uh, medication. So uh, nowadays, we, uh, when we get ill and go to the doctor, for example, for some infections uh, issues, uh, we get some antibiotics and these antibiotics uh, are given uh, based on the statistic data, based on the ages, sex, uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, probably nobody, uh, the people needs uh, uh, different uh, quantities. So uh, a personalized medication is very important and uh, combining this diagnostic with the therapy. So uh, uh, how much we need, uh, how much drug we need and how long we need to use it uh, according to the, the diagnostic is very important. And this is why uh, diagnostic is a very, very interesting issue. So there is a review wrote about standard diagnostics and how we can combine this uh, diagnostic with uh, the therapy. So, but uh, as I mentioned before, so COVID-19 is still, uh, uh, we are still living this and it probably it changed uh, somehow the scenario in terms of the developments of nanobiosensors. And uh, uh, this is a very, very important period of time that in addition to the problems we, we have had, uh, all, we all as scientists in general, but uh, uh, people working in biosensors got a lot of lessons. Uh, uh, and uh, this is why we wrote this uh, recently, this uh, review in ACS Nano, uh, uh, trying to, to, to show uh, how the development of uh, uh, nano diagnostics platforms uh, 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 should be done and which are the bottlenecks in these developments. Uh, uh, so, uh, and these, of course, as in for any other case, are related to the uh, interaction between the different actors, uh, the scientists. So, what we are doing in our lab, what how we plan our work and our, our projects, uh, of course, our collaboration with clinical uh, medical doctors. Uh, but also regulatory bodies, very, very important. And of course, companies, because what we are doing in our lab as scientists is uh, uh, developing new technologies uh, uh, and uh, up to certain 
technology awareness level, but uh, to, to, to increase this uh, TRL, we need uh, a good uh, co cooperation with uh, companies and of course regulatory bodies. And this is why this connection between the sites and the business uh, and trying to increase the TRL is very, very important. And you can have more information there in this. Uh, so how to consider all these bottlenecks and how to, uh, to solve the issues of uh, uh, increasing the TRL and getting something that is really useful because uh, at the very beginning of pandemics uh, and still there are issues, but uh, 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 the technology was not able to offer something that uh, uh, should work fast and, and uh, solve the problems. And still there are issues with uh, the biosensors, the, the, the lateral probe, for example, or because of PCR, because PCR is still very expensive and the lateral go is not able still to address uh, the, the, the problems related to, to, to sensitivity. Multi-detection, you know, uh, COVID-19 is very, very complex, so uh, you need to address several parameters uh, since the day of the infection until, let's say, uh, two, two weeks uh, during which uh, the different components, uh, uh, either uh, the presence of uh, the, the virus in the, in the body and the presence of the different antibodies are changing. So, uh, and it may happen that you have different kinds of viruses uh, and during the pandemics, we have seen different uh, uh, kinds of mutations. And uh, this is what uh, a multi-parametric biosensor should address. Uh, but of course, in all this, uh, we need to offer something that is really flexible and re easy, easily to be tuned according to the needs. Uh, and in fact, uh, what is important for these uh, uh, situations, like for example, the pandemics we have been living, is uh, we consider that uh, to address uh, this issue, to, 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 to build, to send the back sensors to the users, uh, uh, an, uh, an opportunity is also to, to, to develop ubiquitous fabrication uh, technologies uh, for nanobiosensors. So this is why we are uh, uh, very much uh, uh, focused in developing si simple fabrication uh, tools for nanobiosensors. So uh, moving from very bulky uh, technological uh, systems and very expensive to very simple uh, fabrication tools uh, like using uh, uh, inkjet printers uh, that can be uh, distributed wherever you want to have these by sensors. So instead of uh, distributing by sensors, so centralizing by sensors to have decentralized uh, uh, by sensors fabrication, because in this way it will be faster and we can ensure also a kind of democratization of, uh, of, uh, of diagnostics, uh, health issues, uh, overall addressing and uh, helping supporting places with low resources uh, and uh, extreme conditions where you need uh, to have a very fast response uh, in terms of uh, offering the diagnostic uh, devices. So uh, in this uh, context and keeping all this in mind, we have been working with uh, different devices, cost-effective devices, and I'll show you some examples of uh, the different devices we have been uh, working and what we are working recently, starting from optical sensors. Are you hearing me? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Armin. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'll show you some examples of optical sensors we are developing. I'll show you, we are working with uh, colorimetric base sensors, but also fluorescent, electrochromic, bioluminescent sensors. So I'll show you a few examples of these uh, that uh, are really very, very interesting for uh, diagnostic applications. So starting with lateral flow by sensor. So this is a very, very interesting uh, device uh, that you all know because it's nowadays used as a rapid test for COVID. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, how these devices are working, uh, we wrote this uh, uh, nature protocol about uh, how to design and fabricate a nanoparticle based lateral flow, uh, starting from uh, the, 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 the design of the SA, uh, starting on the design of all the components, because uh, in a, a lateral flow based on uh, nanoparticle detection, you have uh, uh, several components, so different nitrocellulose, different sample pads, uh, conjugation pads, uh, uh, and also adsorbent pads. So all these uh, uh, nitrocellulose based pads uh, have different porosity, and you need to very carefully 
uh, determine uh, their, their, their characteristics and, of course, uh, how to uh, immobilize uh, the uh, nanoparticles with antibodies uh, uh, in test control line and all these uh, uh, these issues are, are very well explained in this uh, review. So these uh, devices uh, work in a very simple mode. They work like a, an ELISA where uh, uh, the, the reactions instead of occurring in solution are occurring in a piece of paper. So uh, once you introduce uh, the sample, they are running ar ar along the, the, the paper and uh, getting first uh, nanoparticles with antibodies that are in the conjugation pad and afterward interacting with the primary and sec secondary antibody, uh, giving these uh, nice colors, for example, uh, the, the control line and, and the test line, where you can see, for example, uh, if you are positive or negative toward, for example, COVID. Uh, but also in other applications, uh, uh, you can also get these devices uh, uh, connected even with a smartphone, and you can use these uh, for other applications, for example, even for uh, cancer-related uh, diagnostics, but a lot of other applications. And this is thanks also to the use of nanoparticles. Uh, we have been working a lot with uh, not only gold nanoparticles, but also with magnetic beads, magnetic, sorry, the quantum dots. Uh, and you see here, so for example, different examples of uh, uh, what uh, nanoparticles may bring in, in this lateral flow to get more signal by using, for example, uh, much more uh, stronger labels. Uh, uh, that is uh, very, very important to increase the sensitivity. And so uh, this is for me, uh, one example of uh, uh, lateral flow that we have been developing for uh, bacteria detection. This is based on the uh, quenching of uh, uh, quantum dots. Uh, so, in fact, we have a, a lateral flow with uh, uh, quantum dots uh, uh, that are cadmium selenide modified with antibodies uh, that recognize uh, uh, bacteria. And then we have some other quantum dots in the control line. Uh, so, this uh, uh, system is based on the interaction of uh, 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 graphene oxide, which is a very good quencher of uh, quantum dots. Uh, so when this uh, uh, graphene oxide uh, stand on top of uh, quantum dots, uh, the light of the quantum dots is quenched, is turned off. Uh, but in the case of the sample that does not contain bacteria, this uh, uh, graphene oxide is uh, far away from the quantum dots, so the fluorescence stays on. Uh, so you can see this uh, system, very simple how it is built, how it is responding in this video. And you can see how simple it is to build this kind of devices. We build, as I said, a lateral flow based on the use of nitrocellulose to different porosity. And afterwards, uh, we introduce uh, cadmium selenide uh, quantum dots. We use other kind of quantum dots or other kind of uh, uh, signaling pools and particles. So after introducing quantum dots, uh, so after spotting this onto the paper, you will see that uh, uh, once we excite this uh, with the uh, UV visible lamp, uh, you get a very nice uh, photoluminescence uh, of uh, the quantum dots. Uh, so we have this now, uh, photoluminescence on, and we're introducing the graphene oxide suspension, you'll see that the light is turned off. So based on this interaction, so the quenching of the cadmium selenide by the graphene oxide suspension and controlling the change of the light uh, during this uh, uh, critics uh, uh, in presence and absence, of course, of uh, bacteria, we control and correlate the change of the light uh, with uh, the, the presence and absence of bacteria and even and quantify it uh, uh, depending, of course, on the uh, receptors we are using. Of course, we uh, to optimize the system. There are more data here that I'm not going to enter in detail, but after also controlling of the selectivity, for example, uh, not only uh, detecting for light, but also other pathogens, salmonella, for example, we got a very nice results, uh, which uh, really made the system very, very interesting. Uh, also, uh, we have been working, uh, as I said before, making, pushing the, the, the application of these simple devices, paper-based sensors, even to other areas, like, for example, 
uh, cancer and in collaboration with our partner in Barcelona in uh, San Juan de Deo Hospital in Barcelona. Uh, we applied this also for uh, the detection of uh, parathyroid hormone-like hormones uh, in cancer cells uh, culture by using gold nanoparticles, uh, lateral flow. And here there are some details of uh, the system. So this is a lateral flow uh, based on the use of gold nanoparticles modified with some antibodies against this uh, peptide. Uh, and then, uh, of course, after controlling also these uh, uh, with uh, other uh, control experiments, uh, uh, we, we, we are able to show that uh, uh, this device uh, was showing very nice response uh, for the detection of this uh, uh, hormone, uh, parathyroid hormone-like hormone, uh, which is very, very important uh, this, uh, for the development of some, some drugs uh, uh, for the cancer. Uh, and uh, we, our partner has been using this and we are still working together in another project uh, for the application of lateral flow. Uh, and finally, we uh, moved uh, uh, toward uh, increasing uh, of the improving the performance of this lateral flow uh, because uh, uh, now we are combining uh, this uh, simple lateral flow with electrophoresis with the idea to get uh, a system that is able also to address a uh, much more complex system, like for example, whole blood. And here you can see that uh, how we connect this uh, lateral flow. So this is paper, and then we connected some electrodes here. So applying a, a, a certain potential, and all this was connected with the smartphone, we were able to uh, achieve at the same time uh, separation by electrophoresis. You know that uh, by applying electrophoresis and controlling the, 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 the potential you are applying, you can uh, move the, the different components of the blood, different particles according to their uh, size, according to their charge, electrical charge. So combining this separation with uh, the, the, the optical detection of the uh, lateral flow by using gold nanoparticles, we are able to improve the, 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 the interferences. You see here some data about uh, this uh, uh, device uh, and also uh, its operation uh, during uh, application of uh, uh, the, the electrophoresis. You see here how the blood is moving uh, during the application of the potential, and then the, the, the detection lines are appearing. So uh, you can see here clear changes, for example, of the, 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 the quality of the lines uh, when we apply uh, this uh, electrophoresis. So it means that uh, we are improving the sensitivity of the system for complex samples uh, by using uh, electrophoresis, so getting uh, better sensitivity and lower detection limit uh, thanks to the synergy between electrophoresis and uh, 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 lateral flow. So this is uh, really very, very interesting and we are moving toward uh, uh, other applications with this uh, uh, very, very interesting uh, system. Uh, also, we have been applying uh, uh, nanopaper. So nanopaper, nitrocellulose paper is based on the fibers, nanofibers. Uh, uh, and uh, this uh, nanopaper is uh, produced by a specific bacteria. Uh, after uh, putting some substrates, uh, so we get this very nice uh, uh, nano paper that we uh, load with different kind of nanoparticles. So we put on inside this nano paper uh, silver, gold, uh, quantum dots, uh, up converting quantum dots, uh, converting this nano paper that is in fact uh, uh, transparent. You see here the most transparent in front of the windows of our institute, but when you get it. Uh, a loaded uh, dot with uh, a silver or gold nanoparticles, uh, you see this very nice colored paper. What we did is uh, uh, we show how this was uh, interacting, for example, with different kinds of uh, materials, and we are able to use this simple change of the color with uh, uh, some uh, nice applications, for example, uh, detection of cyanide, because cyanide is interacting with uh, gold uh, uh, due to some complex uh, formations of corroding nanoparticles. And uh, uh, this is why the, the plasmonics were so changing. So this was a nice opportunity to have a very simple device, as simple, for example, as a, a paper, use paper test for pH. Uh, so as to detect something very easy, so just uh, to alert for the presence of a contaminant or other application. 
Then, for example, we combine this uh, uh, nanopaper-based sensor uh, for making it specific, for example, to detect bacteria by connecting uh, quantum dots with antibodies, uh, uh, addressing, for example, pathogens, uh, and uh, uh, detecting this, uh, even the presence of other uh, pathogens, so with the high selectivity, thanks to the antibodies we used. Uh, but I mean, uh, this uh, very simple device uh, combined with antibodies uh, is uh, transformed to a very selective uh, device for cost efficient detection. And here are some data about this uh, uh, the, uh, detection so from the micrographs uh, showing the presence of bacteria and how this correlates with the change of the intensity of the quantum dots. Uh, and uh, of course, going toward more integrated system, we recently uh, uh, showed the application of uh, a very, very interesting whole integrated system. And this is a really very universal platform. We're very proud of this uh, very compact system that uh, is a low cost user friendly, all integrated smartphone based uh, uh, microplate reader. In fact, uh, uh, this is a kind of Lysa, but um, uh, uh, done uh, in a very integrated mode, connected to the smartphone, so we can have this uh, for any kind of applications. Uh, for example, we can measure uh, fluorescence uh, of uh, uh, quantum dots uh, based uh, uh, by multiple systems. In fact, we applied this uh, system with uh, with uh, for different applications. Uh, uh, for example. We uh, applied this uh, for uh, colorimetric uh, detection even of COVID-19 uh, by using some antibodies against uh, uh, N protein, for example, and uh, uh, using some uh, uh, <coughs> some uh, uh, substrates uh, uh, and uh, based on the HRT enzyme, but also uh, bioluminescent measurements. So by using a uh, bioluminescent bacteria. That we have been reported also, we have been reporting for other applications, but also uh, turbidity measurements of antibiotic resistance. So, what that would, whatever uh, application you do with NISA, uh, which is really a very universal system, you can you can do with this uh, very small, uh, very compact integrated system connected to a smartphone, which uh, really brings uh, uh, to the end users nowadays uh, a, a huge opportunity for a lot of uh, biological applications, as I said, uh, with different kind of uh, uh, measurements uh, with interest for different kinds of analytical applications for health area, but also safety, security, environmental monitoring, uh, food testing, and more. Uh, so this is um, what they are doing with this. Uh, and uh, now let me show you in the next uh, uh, slides uh, 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 some examples of elect electrical sensors. So again, these are uh, very interesting devices, uh, uh, cost-efficient devices with interest for uh, different applications. So uh, in electrical sensors, we have been working a lot uh, with uh, environmental based detection, but also we have interest in potentiometric, conductometric, impedimetric, field effect transistors. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we have uh, a patented technology for which our uh, spin-off company is working. So stamping of uh, uh, exfoliated graphene using a wax uh, uh, printed membrane. So based on this technology, we're able to transfer uh, any kind of uh, uh, graphene oxide or even composites of graphene oxide with different kind of uh, nanomaterials. Uh, uh, we applied also this uh, material to, to do some electroluminescent panels. I'm not going to show this today, but uh, we are still moving toward improvement, improvement of this uh, uh, graphene-based electrodes, so the stamping technology, improvement of this by using laser scribing. Uh, so some of the application of these uh, electrical sensors uh, uh, include uh, Alzheimer's disease biomarker detection in human samples, uh, uh, where we got advantages of uh, uh, electrocatalytic uh, properties of gold nanoparticles, so toward uh, uh, hydrogen evolution reaction. And so this is a very, very interesting uh, property, but in this case, in this application, we applied also use magnetic uh, 
uh, beads, uh, so uh, connected with uh, antibodies that uh, were recognizing this uh, Alzheimer-related biomarker and the secondary antibody with uh, golden particles that were used uh, for hydrogen evolution reaction. Uh, based on this, we are able to detect uh, 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 this uh, biomarker at uh, very low and nanogram per milliliter uh, concentration uh, and uh, uh, offer this as a very interesting tool for <clears throat> diagnostics. Uh, also, we have been working with uh, COVID-19. So recently, one of my collaborators, uh, Marie Curie, the uh, postdoc, uh, uh, and they really reported this very nice system uh, for based on aptamers uh, uh, and uh, gold uh, wire for the detection of uh, uh, diagnostic of COVID uh, uh, by using a redox reporter, by using aptamer. So what happened here is that uh, the interaction of this aptamer with uh, the ash protein uh, uh, is uh, changing the conformation. So uh, the position of uh, the distance from the redox reporter with the electrode is changing, uh, open the recognition. So increasing the electronic uh, signal, so increasing the current. Uh, so we have a system that uh, open the recognition is increasing the, uh, the, the, the response. Uh, so we control all this. Uh, and we will also show that uh, this system was able to detect uh, in some artificial saliva, so the presence of this protein. So this is very nice system because in addition, it is reversible. So if you want to have a continuous monitoring, it is very nice in comparison to antibodies that in fact, when you interact the antibody with antigen, you are blocking this uh, this conjugate. But in the case of the uh, the the, the aptamers, you may have a kind of reversible system. So this is very nice for continuous monitoring. And uh, finally, this is I think the, the the last example I wanted to show you. See, so this is a plug and print and play inkjet printing and dance based uh, by sensing technology that operates through a smartphone for clinical diagnostics. So as I said before, we want to offer these very simple system technologies that uh, you can print your space sensors any, in any place in the world. You don't need to have a clean room. So uh, first of all, uh, we designed the, the, the by sensor. So we fabricate it uh, using a screen printer. Uh, of course, we combine this also with some insulation. For example, we use wax coating and after some laser etching, so we can uh, uh, do uh, nice contacts uh, uh, of uh, these uh, electrodes. So uh, in this case, for example, we applied the system for the detection of uh, a biomarker Engal. This is the neutrophil terpenes associated uh, lipoxaline, which is a biomarker for acute kidney infection. Uh, which is with interest for liver cirrhosis uh, diagnostics. Uh, so, of course, after drawing, first of all, the biosensors and loading the nanomaterial based ink into a consumer ink printer, we printed the biosensors, so functionalized it with the uh, aptamer, and after this, uh, connecting with the smartphone to read uh, the result. Uh, and here I've shown some of the results, so now we'll supply this uh, uh, for uh, a wearable. Uh, and fully printed microfluidic uh, nano sensor for uh, the detection of switch rate, conductivity, and copper detection with interest for healthcare applications. So, uh, this is a collaboration work with our colleagues in Colombia, uh, where uh, the system is used, uh, uh, is uh, assuring, first of all, the active switch simulation by using reverse uh, neontophoresis. Uh, uh, with the sweat rate compensation, continuous monitoring, microfluidic uh, also in the place. Uh, you can see here this uh, wearable device, some data, data, and how we get the response, for example, of this uh, electrochemical stripping of uh, copper, which is a very important uh, parameter for some clinical uh, applications where you see the response uh, toward the, the changes of concentration of copper and some more details about. Uh, uh, this uh, skin tissue vertical structure of the system, so this wearable, where you can see the different details, uh, the layers used uh, uh, for this uh, device, uh, and also a cross section here uh, showing the microchannel profilometry of the device. Uh, 
uh, and how it is uh, set up uh, uh, to achieve these uh, measurements. And finally, uh, some more data about uh, the calibration as the conductivity nanosensor, but also a uh, microfluidic channel uh, that is responding. And here, just to show, there are some colored uh, uh, dry drops uh, uh, added uh, and also uh, the response uh, you can see here of uh, the conductivity of the system uh, at certain frequency and also uh, the impedance of the volume sensor at the fixed comfort uh, fixed uh, uh, frequency. So this is uh, all I wanted to, to show you today. And if you need more information, we wrote this review so, uh, for different applications, so nanomaterial-based uh, devices for point-of-care applications, nanodiagnostics even to face COVID-19 issues, nanotranagnostics, uh, microbiome-related uh, 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 application uh, coupled with nanotechnology. We are working in a big European project for microbiome uh, role in the uh, uh, diagnostic of uh, cirrhosis, uh, uh, but also other application of nanobiosensors, very, very important, how to reach very, very high sensitivity, low detection limit. So atomolar uh, analyte detection in this recent review in Chemical Society Review, but also interesting application like, for example, electrochromism, which is a very interesting approach for biosensing uh, technology. So with all this, I wish that uh, I convinced you that uh, there are a lot of opportunities to connect uh, uh, nanomaterials, different kinds of nanomaterials with simple platforms uh, like paper, plastics, uh, to build uh, cost-effective devices uh, and also connecting this with uh, uh, communication technologies, smartphone, and also other tools uh, with interest for different applications, but overall to ensure the so-called reassured uh, uh, characteristics, which is very important for healthcare applications. So I'd like to thank also all our funders, so uh, European pro projects, uh, national projects, our uh, institutes uh, who are supporting our research and also uh, different partners uh, all over the world we are working with the uh, uh, graphene flex sheet and of course uh, the micropredict project emerge we are also collaborating together with uh, uh, costas and other colleagues uh, in greece uh, uh, so uh, thank you very much for your attention and i'll be very happy to give any response if you have any questions thank you very much Thank you very much, Alben, for this nice presentation. Uh, if you please stop sharing the screen and check if there are some questions from the audience. Um, I will give them some, uh, if, I mean, are there any questions from the audience? Um, let's give them some time to think. I have some questions, Alben. One yeah. of the most, uh, I mean, one of the most um, uh, crucial challenges, uh, I will give them the floor to Pavlos Yanaku after my question. Thank you, Pablos. Uh, one of the most um, uh, crucial challenges regarding sensing is the discrimination. So it's not only the rise and the fall time that, you know, I could not see this in the biosensors uh, as compared to the gas sensors, but one of the most crucial things is the discrimination. So how sure you are that this kind of um, sensing elements, they can discriminate uh, their sensing ability. Like uh, how, uh, how, how you can be so sure that your detection is not due to any other molecule or any other bio molecule and not COVID-19, if you understand what do I mean? How, 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 you, how, how, how they can discriminate from one agent to the other? Yeah, uh, this is a very, very important question. And in fact, uh, this is uh, a very uh, big challenge because uh, one of the, the, the requisites your biosensor should have to be successful is to have the selectivity. So to be selective and to, to discriminate between the analyte you want to detect and the others that may interfere. One of the crucial points here is uh, in the case, for example, of uh, biomolecular or in case, for example, of virus, uh, to have the right uh, uh, good quality receptor. And this is very important. In fact, we are addressing this soon in the in next uh, our next paper about COVID where we have been evaluating different kinds of receptors and showing how crucial and how important is the quality of the receptor. So it also raised another important issue that uh, uh, the need for collaboration, the need for 
the collaboration overall in, in important situations like COVID, uh, in which uh, the community of scientists, like for example, we working in technology with colleagues working in uh, development of receptors should collaborate and offer uh, clear uh, data, open data about uh, the, 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 the materials they offer, because uh, either we lose time in uh, checking different kinds of receptors to find the best one, but also sometimes we are spending a lot of money and we are not getting the right receptor. So this is very important. Of course, uh, considering that you have a good technology, sensitive enough, uh, but I mean the role of the receptors is very, very important. And of course, once we have this receptor, we need to evaluate them. We used to evaluate them using ELISA, but also then we evaluate them in our system and they are of course, conventional tools to, to evaluate the, the, the discrimination capability of this biosensor by using several analytical tests and comparison with the, the presence, absence of different uh, other components, uh, uh, so as to show that really your sensor is, is giving response uh, that you want and is not uh, confusing and giving some false uh, positive response or negative responses. Uh, so this is very, very important. So, yeah, thank you very much. So, Arben, in order to summarize, this means that it is mainly it's based on the receptors material that you are using in order to be able to discriminate uh, uh, the agent that you would like to identify. Am I right? Yeah, of course, there are, there are more issues. I, I, I didn't answer, but for, of course, we control very well these issues. For, for example, in case of sensor, you need to block uh, very well the sensing surface uh, so as to ensure uh, non-specific bonding of other components because mm -hmm. if you do not control the sensing surface uh, uh, you may have a good receptor but still another component can be attached onto the surface of the sensor so you need to block the surface so there are other issues that uh, should uh, kept in mind so mm -hmm. this is very complex but one of the most important i wanted to mention is the quality of the receptor considering that you know how to, the biosensor is working and how to, to remove the possible interferences by applying some strategies that I mentioned, for example, uh, blocking of the surface that would ensure some extra interactions that uh, provoke also some false positive results. Mm -hmm. Regarding the, bio, uh, the biosensor, this is the last question from my side. It seems that you don't have any time dynamics. So in order to be able to train your system through this time dynamics to, to discriminate you know, agency, agent from agent. Uh, is this true? Because I could not see any time dynamics regarding the biosensor. It seems to me that it's like one use sensors, you detect or yeah. you don't detect and then you recycle. Yeah, uh, so most of the sensors we are doing are uh, one use only because they are disposable for this kind of applications. So, but of course, sometimes we are doing some kinetic measurements I didn't show here, which are very important also for other issues, not to ensure the continuous monitoring. For example, in case of COVID, the sensor I showed you, for example, for Optamer is also ensuring a, a dynamic response. So uh, during the time, as I mentioned, it may be useful also to control the presence of the, the COVID during time because the aptamer is such that uh, the interaction of aptamers with, uh, with uh, proteins, antigens, uh, are reversible, so you can ensure a continuous monitoring. But if you are working with uh, the antibodies, you are not able to ensure this continuous monitoring because once you interact the antibody with antigen, uh, you cannot uh, open it again, I, unless you apply some technologies that are uh, adding some, let's say, some reagents that uh, remove the antigen and make this available for the next measurements. Or you remove the sensing surface using some uh, strategies. We've been working also on this, but it didn't show here. Sometimes, for example, uh, we had a project with uh, continuous monitoring, for example, in an uh, industrial application where you need to have your sensor to, to make some continuous monitoring. In this case, for example, we, we use some magnetic beads, uh, so putting uh, new magnetic beads with fresh, for example, enzyme or fresh uh, antibodies. So each time you wanted to measure, you, 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 you change, you renew the sensing surface. So this is a very, very important issue, but uh, should be very carefully uh, considered according to the application. Thank you very much, Armen. I give the floor now to Mr. Uh, Yanaku Pavlos. The floor is yours. Um, hi everyone, uh, this is Pavlo Ziannagou from DOC Innovation Center of Univers uh, University of Cyprus. 
Uh, thank you, Arben, for the very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I have two questions. Basically, one question was covered by Costantino, so I'll just go ahead with the second one. Um, I'm just wondering whether the uh, specifications and methods for making diagnostic devices using nanomaterials um, have been always the same, or are there any lessons learned during the pandemic that made you change the, the scheme, for example, of uh, designing and fabricating uh, diagnostic devices? Uh, for example, just um, you've shown us nicely the reassured acronym protocol for that diagnostic devices. Has always been the same, or are there any lessons learned during the pandemic that changed this, uh, this scheme? Yeah, one of, one of the most important lessons, I think, uh, uh, from the pandemics is, uh, as I mentioned, we need to have a very, very cost efficient devices. So we cannot address, for example, pandemics with, a, with very expensive device. So far, for example, uh, you have seen for a very accurate measurements, you need to, to do PCR and PCR is still very expensive. So we still do not have a sensor that is doing uh, achieving the same sensitivity as PCR system. It means that uh, uh, you need uh, we still uh, need to put efforts in developing uh, as sensitive as PCR uh, by sensor, but uh, less expensive and very fast. Uh, this is, for example, an issue that uh, still uh, should be addressed uh, because the, the current uh, lateral flow devices are good. Uh, for fast response, but still they have uh, uh, not the, 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 the requested sensitivity. And sometimes you cannot, uh, uh, for, for to be sure about this, you need to address to do after a PCR, test, after uh, a lateral flow, for example, you need to, to repeat it probably and do a PCR. But also, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, the, the, the clinical scenario, even for COVID is very complex. So uh, when you go and do what would like to do a test, you don't know, sometimes if you are in the first day or in the seventh day of your infection. And depending on the day, uh, you, you may have in blood different things. You may have less or more uh, and, uh, virus load, but also uh, different kinds of antibodies are uh, formed during the, the infection period. So uh, you don't know what you are measuring. So you measure probably uh, one antibody if you want to see the immunization, but probably are not measuring another antibody. So you need to, to have also a, a multi-parametric test probably. So I mean, uh, all these, the, there are different issues. So uh, still there are a lot of things to do. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, so uh, these are some of the lessons, uh, take home lessons that say we have from this uh, pandemic, but also, as I said, uh, uh, very, very important. So in this technology, which is a very, very multidisciplinary, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, we need the receptors. So we buy this usually for, from the market and we need to know and to be sure about the quality of the, the, the receptors. We have seen, you have heard that, uh, for example, even in Spain, they were bought a lot of uh, lateral flow at the beginning and they, they were not working because uh, one of the reasons was that uh, antibodies were not uh, responding very good or probably the technology was not that good. So I mean, there are a lot of issues and still there is a lot of uh, work to do uh, to make these devices uh, really very, very useful. Of course, these depend on, so on the, the, the funding because there are some sensors working perfectly nowadays, for example, uh, glucose, uh, the market is there, and this is why there is a lot of funding, and these biosensors are, are most perfectly working. Uh, even now, uh, glucose biosensor is, uh, uh, can be done even as a wearable, so you don't need to take samples, but you just have this uh, uh, in your body, and uh, by, based on some nanoelectrodes, you are getting the response, uh, and these devices may work even uh, during two weeks, or sometimes companies are trying to push uh, the, the lifetime toward longer, let's say. I mean, there are a lot of st issues still, so. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo, for the question and Arben for the response. And before, I, and before we end, Arben, I have one question from Curiosity. One of the detectors that you have used, uh, you have employed graphene oxide. It was one, a graphene oxide as a top uh, protective layer, if I remember well. Uh, why graphene oxide and not reduced graphene oxide, for example? Can you please give me more details? 
Yeah, uh, it was uh, because uh, uh, graphene oxide, uh, in fact, uh, uh, still there are some not totally uh, graphene oxide. So, uh, uh, but the, 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 as we use this in suspension, so graphene oxide, given the charges, so it may have uh, better stability. So you need to have this in a very good suspension. And this is why we want to keep under control the, the oxidation grade of graphene because uh, uh, we are sure that we have a good suspension. But uh, the, the, what is uh, uh, provoking the quenching of fluorescence is a kind of uh, a contribution both. So not only the graphene oxide oxidation grade, but also the other part of uh, non-oxidized. So, I mean, but the oxidation, the use of graphene oxide is for the, 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 to keep this in suspension. Otherwise you, you get this uh, agglomerated and uh, you cannot run then the graphene oxide in the lateral flow because it's going to be blocked. Okay, yes, very correct. All right, so I think that uh, since we have no more questions, I would like to thank you again, Arben, for your contribution once again. Uh, for our initiatives here in Hellenic Mediterranean University. And uh, we hope to meet you, to meeting you in person very soon after, you know, this kind of restrictions and limitations will be lift over forever. Uh, thanks to your research, since I can see that you are doing a lot of things towards fighting COVID-19. Uh, I would like to thank also the audience for their, for their participation. And uh, I wish you to have a nice day, a nice weekend and stay safe. Thank you, Armin, and thank you all. Bye. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. See you too. Bye. And uh, wish to see you soon in person. Yeah. Take Thank care. You. Bye bye. Thank you, Albert. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye bye.